This is your place for all things Grand Rapids Griffins and all things Toledo Walleye. This is the Hockey Town West Podcast with your host, Brandon Cook and Nick Harrington. Welcome back to the Hockey Town West Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Brandon. I'm your other host, Nick. Yeah, you are. And we are here to talk about some exciting stuff because holy smokes, the Griffins have extended their point streak officially to 18 games. Wild. Absolutely wild. Which is who we beat to extend that streak. <laughs> yeah, Max. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I was thinking back. I was like, what did the wall I hit last year under Dan Watson? What was that win streak? Was it 18? And it was 18. It was a win yep. streak. It's a little different than a point streak, but first year very new team a lot of new players and to be able to string together an 18 game point streak with with the schedule they have coming up possible to continue this that possibility is really high like it yeah it's crazy this is nuts it is about to i i wanted to look up these stats and maybe we'll have them for the next episode but i wanted to see like this was right around that same time that toledo went on their 18 game win streak God, if I remember right, it's almost like perfect to the, to the month. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's it's weird. Dan Watson in the uh, second half of the season is a beast. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah, but, I'm like trying to figure out if it's Costa time or Wadi time because it was always like Izo time, right? March Madness, you yeah. get that turned over, and it's like okay, February. It is it Wadi or is it Costa? So. Um, I wanted to go back through those stats and see because we were in Toledo right about a week or two from the date of right now. So uh, it was shortly after the streak ended too before we got there because we were all nervous that like if we got there and they were still on it, the game we finally went to for the first time they were going to lose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a little bit of nervousness, but I mean we're we're doing well right now. We're doing really well. Outside of that, man, before we jump into games, how are you? How are you doing? I know we're both exhausted. This episode could be full of energy. It might not be. Who knows? We'll see how we do this because we had a long weekend. But how are you doing? I mean, I feel bad the when we broke Milwaukee's win streak. Like we were both tired. We were both exhausted after the season ticket event. And then we come back and we record, and we're just like, "Oh yeah, we we broke the streak. Like we, our streak continues." And then like then we went and we recorded Wednesday. And we're just like high energy. Like here we go. We're going to the playoffs. We're gonna win. Our, we're not gonna win it. We're not gonna lose a game going forward. And today we're like, oh my gosh, how many games are left? <laughs> Let's just start the playoffs now. It's just like, I mean, I was in Detroit Tuesday and then uh, we had game Wednesday. We had game Friday. We had game Saturday. And then uh, we're looking at the schedule. We're like, okay, we just have tomorrow's game Monday uh, or today's game Monday because this will come out tomorrow against Cleveland. So, I mean, Cleveland's always a wild game, man. So uh, we're both just like, <laughs> drag it to yeah, it and that leads right into the freaking trade deadline like this past week and then yeah. this week it's like this is this is a lot this is gonna be a mentally draining week for sure it'll be emotional for nick too i mean he's attached I, to players i'm so attached to players like now and i'm like seeing all these trade like packages lined up of like bear grid Johansson uh being packaged together for players i'm just like no like don't do this like it's so friday it's gonna be a ball of anxiety probably a little bit of depression and uh i'll probably need to be checked out a few times because i'll be scrolling through twitter just like everybody else or x whatever you want to call it uh keeping the updates alive for the trade deadline and maybe steve makes a move before then who knows i mean there's no games after monday till friday for the griffin so it's not going to affect anything, you know. We're not going to have to pull a player out or sit a player to be for trade. So, yeah, and depending how it will go, too, we might. If if it super involves the Griffins in any way, shape, or form, we'll probably put a little episode out Friday night after the Chicago game, uh, just to kind of recap the trade deadline and talk about it. And hopefully, you just don't see an episode from us that night. That means nothing crazy, majorly impacting the Griffins happened, and things will be smooth sailing into the playoffs for these guys. Because uh, I think we're our fully, fully on that wagon now. Of uh, this is a playoff team, and they're going to the playoffs. They're a possible deep run playoff team. So, should we dive into the Iowa game? I think it's time. Let's, yep. Let's get so wild. The Griffins take 
Yeah, let's, get, let's get wild. I hate you. Uh, <laughs> the Griffins uh, take on the Iowa Wild on Friday in, at Van Andel and end up winning this game 4-3. to three. And what a wild game it was. Honestly, I know we're going to keep using that pun here, but it, it was a really wild game. Iowa outshoots Grand Rapids in this one, 31-23. to 23. Michael Hutchinson has a great, great game uh, after, you know, some shaky starts recently. He's put together a couple of good games since then, and this was one of them. And I feels this feels like this game happened last week at this point to me. That's where my yeah. brain's at. So bear with me here. This was a game filled with goals, lots of goals, and goals by important players that we like to see scoring right now. Carter Mazur gets his 13th of the season for the Griffins. Uh, that was the first Griffin's goal of the game. Elmer gets his eighth of the season, assisted by Lombardi and Tua Misto. Berggren gets his 18th of the season, and Zach Aston Reese gets the game winner, his 10th goal of the season. And uh, poor Jesper Wallstead, man. 19 saves on 23 shots. That's his four goals against there. None of those were empty netters. He's clearly struggling since that NHL stint where he left in seven, like or let in seven. This is a... Uh, it was not the same Jesper Walsh that we've seen play. I know the team in front of him is not a talented team by any means right now. I know they're really struggling with their roster, but at the same time, there is some really good players in this team. And he just does not look like the guy that we saw at the beginning of the season where we're like, oh, we're playing him tonight. Great. Like you anticipate where you come in, you know, we had to play against Askarov, right? We get Wallstead back to back games. Like you're like, we're going to lose one of those games. We have to. And we, we don't. Like, neither of those two goalies were able to keep up with this team, and Wallstead was wasn't good, man. Was not good at all. No, and that's I mean I think that we were surprised that Wallstead got pulled up so early, and everybody is like banging the drums to get Coast up, and I, I think that really speaks to you know you have to let your players develop. You cannot rush them because this Wallstead that came back, like you can't say that this did not rock him of being up there for get letting in seven goals. Like he's fallen off a cliff since then. Right. And coast has gone the exact opposite. Like his stats continue to get better as the season goes, just like it was last year in Toledo. So you can't rush them. You have to let them develop. You got to give them the time. Um, and you see like, well, that's still here. Ascroft's still down here as well. I mean, that might change after Friday's deadline, but uh, you, you just got you got to let them go. And Spencer Knight last year was Florida. Where is he at this year? Down here and down here in the A. Like not doing great either. Not doing great. Yeah. So it's you, you got to give them time. You got to be patient. Yep. So let's talk about these goal scorers real quick here. So Carter Mazer. I mean, we've been talking about him a lot recently because he's finding the back of the net a lot recently. He's silently moved into second place in scoring on this team. He's got 29 points in his 44 games in the season, and just playing at a level right now where I I haven't seen him play yet in the AHL. Like this is a whole new territory for him. And that, and I mean, look at what he did this weekend overall. He just had a fantastic weekend, but he had a three point game in this on outside of that goal. He had two assists in this game as well. Like get healthy scratch, come back and have a three point game. Yeah. The, his what goal more was, could you ask for? His goal was sick too. Like they dumped it in, uh, and Walsh that tries to play it, they turn it over right at the red line. And then uh, Mazer goes right into like right in the slot and puts it in one on one with with Walsh. I mean, it was just you. It was just a beautiful goal. I mean, it's one of those ones where you think he's going to get like ask or Walsh that's going to grab that puck and he puts it right over. So, I mean, it was good to get back on the wall and the score sheet. It's. And then he just starts. He's one of those guys that we've said before. He's like, once he starts piloting the stats, like his confidence starts growing and he just continues to go down that. So um, it was a beautiful goal. And two of yeah. was the one who turned it over, uh, who got the turnover. Yep. To get it set yeah. him up. Two was forcing takeaways and setting him up like that. It was beautiful. The next goal, though, man, by Elmer, <laughs> this shift, this shift, this whole shift from this line for this Elmer goal absolutely out of this world might be the shift of the season, honestly. And people are going to think we're a little biased saying that because the guy that kicked off the shift, but it's on Twitter. Go watch it. It's 32 second clip. It's worth the watch. It's probably our biggest clip of the weekend. Honestly, it's as funny as that is, but Amadeus Lombardi using his side or his speed and skill skates in 
just goes around everybody, making them look silly. For, it makes a pass here, a pass there. The puck ends up back on an Iowa stick. He takes it away again. Gets it back to 2-0. 2 gets it back to him in a no-look pass to the front of the net. Mind you, the pass to keep the play alive behind the net to 2-0 was also a no-look pass by Lombardi. So he throws a no-look pass out into the slot that lands right on Elmer's stick as he skated between the two defensemen. He is all alone with Wallstead right in front of the goal and roofs it over a guy who, or a Wallstead who was already down trying to make the save. Roofs it over him like that. That was an NHL shift by that line, and this is our fourth freaking line. Yeah, this the Bergy Mazer and Casper line is doing fantastic, and this ammo Elmer and who's the other guy? It, it was Ben Cross a couple times, but who was it? Cross that? majority of the time, uh, but then Gettinger. Uh, this this night it was Cross. Cross was in for this one. Uh, Saturday night was it, Gettinger slotted in there, but this line. It, this line was fantastic, and that Elmer goal was like just so beautiful. Like he he shows his gloves right there, his his handwork right there is like gets that he does a little spin and just puts it, buries it in the top. Like just fantastic. I was like, this is the Elmer that we all want to see. Parked in front of the net, there was a little bit of a screen on it. Uh, Cross was the the guy screening uh, Wallstead, and then Elmer just puts it in. Like it just. Fantastic, fantastic. And it was huge for uh, Elmer to be able to get that gold. That puts him at eight for the season. Yeah, I mean, he's silently moved up to 11th in scoring in this team. He's got 21 points in 46 games. And the majority of those have come from the second half of the season. He's really turned it on lately. And he's he's a player that I could see kind of fitting anywhere in the lineup now. If for any reason that some changes happen on Friday and he's got to be moved up, I'm comfortable with that. Beginning of the season? No, I'm terrified by that idea. Right now, I'm like, okay, I like the sound of this, but also at the same time, the chemistry him and Lombardi have built is unreal right now. I mean, Cross is still trying to figure out his way right now and figure out his season, and he spends some nights in the press box and some nights on the ice, and he hasn't been able to find that same chemistry with those two. But, dude, they're on another level right now. And the craziest part, when you peel it back and look at the lines, like you said, the Casper Berge, Mazer line, that's fun. Our third line, uh, Les Brantz, Aston Reese and Shine. They tear it up. It's a grind line this, right there. Yeah, and this fourth line is tearing it up. The first line is honestly the one where I'm scratching my head going, why aren't <laughs> they putting in a goal per game at least easily? Like yeah. the bottom three lines are tearing it up. And when you have that kind of depth and you start thinking playoffs, you're like, holy F, we're, we're going to do something here. It's special. But that shift, man, I, I, that shift is replayed in my head 60 times this weekend at least. Being right there on the glass to see it too in person was pretty sweet. Not gonna lie, uh, but yeah, that was that was a fun one. But of course, the guy we talk about, I think, who scores a goal almost every single game lately, Jonathan Berggren gets his 18th. This was one that was assisted by Mazer and Volander, and to this shot, this shot was a beauty, an absolute beauty. Wall said, Wall said stood no chance on this one. It's probably the one goal in the game where I'm like, yeah, he, he, there was no stopping that one. No it's, stopping it at all. It just leaked in. <laughs> like, just slipped past his bottom pad. Yep. <laughs> he was, he, Bergy put it in a spot that it shouldn't have went, and it, it went. And <laughs> it's, yeah, I love it. But then the goal to cap out the night, too, Zach Aston Reese. I mean, just another good goal by him. We said uh, after the team signing, you know, he said that he thought his goal song might have turned into never going to score a goal again. And he scored quite a few since then and quite a few in the second half of the season here, too. I mean, him up to 10 goals this season with how he started the season in Grand Rapids, where we just didn't see anything from him at all. And then he got the random little call up to Detroit and then got back down. And ever since then, money, absolute money, especially if shines on the ice with them. Like the chemistry between those two is unreal right now. It's Absolutely getting, unreal. It's getting so much better too. Uh, he had a goal Wednesday, and then he had a goal again Friday. So a little two goal game streak for him. Uh, somebody that's not like super known uh, plays his part, does it well. Like I, it's kind of like JT Comper for me. Like he plays every time he scores a goal. I'm like, win? How? How does he have this many goals? Because those are the games that I literally miss. But um, yeah, like Zach's been great for us. Uh, that third line with him and Shine, or yeah. Him and Shine have just been like shutting down the opponent's uh, lines and just 
grinding it out. So um, it's good. It's good. Yeah, Zach Aston Reese had three points on this team up until December 5th. Three points. How many does he have now? Currently on the season, he's at 22 points. He's at 10 goals, 12 assists. So 19, game, like 19 points. 19 points since December 5th. Which is about the time that the that we went on this crazy point streak. It's about the time things started to really kick off. I mean, he had a three-point night on the 5th and then a one-point night in the ninth, and then the 27th of December, the post-Christmas game. He's had points in a ton of the games. There's not really been a long stretch. I think his longest stretch without points was four games. That's an impressive turnaround, which again, it just speaks to this team starting to gel and mesh and really figure it out. Like that's what we needed to have happen. And we knew it was going to happen. It was going to take time. Yeah. Might've taken a little longer than we hoped it would. We wanted it to happen a little quicker, but that's just because we went through hell last year. Uh, so we wanted to see him really take off with the talent this team has. But this team at this point has just shown that they don't care who they're playing against. They will take anybody a full three period hockey game at this point. And a lot of the cases, um, some extra time, but you know, (laughs) yeah, this game, this game, looking at it, like when I watched it, I was like, they definitely don't deserve to win this game. Like they were, they were outshot. They were outplayed. I just, I didn't think like Hutch really kept them in this game. The whole yep. night, Hutch played fantastic. Big save after big save, uh, a little bit of flair. He was feeling it. Uh, a couple of those, so I was like, "This one was pretty much stolen from Iowa." And Iowa's been playing really well as of late because um, they just took down Milwaukee. <laughs> they did take down Milwaukee <laughs> today. Week. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, they're not a bad team. They're not a great team, but we, we talk a lot of trash because of who their assistant coach is. Because it's the guy who put us through hell last year in Grand Rapids. So. Not just us, I'm sure the players too. Anyways, <laughs> but like, yeah, they're not a they're not a they're not a bad team. They I don't like their play style. I think their play style is just get under your skin or try to throw the body as much as possible and hope that they can get something out of it. And they started to get under Grand Rapids' skin a little bit in this game, and you could kind of sense that. But at the same time, Grand Rapids has done a lot better about staying calm with that. The officiating this game was not the best the game management was okay but it wasn't the greatest i mean the part that i think really kept grand habits from running away with this one is the fact they went over four on the power play again yeah. another game with no power play goal it's getting ridiculous at this point but what kept him in this game was going five yeah. for five on the pk yeah i don't understand why our power play is this bad with the level of talent we have and the scoring we've been seeing recently like there's very few games where there's three or less goals scored. Yeah. We can't score when there's one less guy on the ice for the other team. Like we like the other guy. I don't, I don't, I don't know what this is. Like we used to, when we had the empty net for us. Like that used to be a clutch play for Grand Rapids. Empty netters. They were going to get them every time with that extra man on the ice and power play back then was also humming too. Luckily we haven't needed the empty net in most of our scenarios lately, but at the same time, Power play, man. Something's got to change. And we saw it change. A, we saw a few shifts on Friday night. We saw more shifts Saturday night, which we'll talk about when we talk about that game. But special teams could have lost us this game. Yeah. I mean, it's they struggle. They struggle setting it up. I've, I watched the kid Friday and Saturday. Like they struggle getting into the zone and keeping it in the zone after like you, they waste a full minute trying to get set up. And then it's, and it's cr- like crunch time for them trying to figure out let you know let's get the play going let's get the play going and get some shots on that so it's just it's been tough i don't know i, I need to look more into the face offs like we've said before of well, with tyler of losing the face off and then brings it there but the face off played a huge role in the in the saturday's game we'll get to that there yeah. there is one thing i want to call out too cuz it's, you know, it's a player we talk very positively about on the defensive side of things. And again, plus minus isn't the only stat in the world when you judge a d- defense or offense, but we always want to notice outliers. And Albert Johansson was a minus three Friday night. He was on the ice for every Iowa goal. He did not have a great game Friday. It, it, it just wasn't his best. You know, you look at the, you look at the other end of the spectrum. Who's he compared to all season long, right? Simon and Simon had a plus three in that game. 
it's it just wasn't Albert's best night. And you know, we always criticize Simon when he has bad nights, and I think it's unfair if we don't criticize Albert when he has a bad night too. And it it wasn't just you know, he just didn't seem like himself in that game. He just seemed out of position a few times. It seemed like Iowa had really figured out his positioning and kind of how to get around him. I mean, there was one play where he got walked a little bit, but that didn't result in the goal on that play, luckily. But at the same time, like, it just wasn't his best. And that's okay. You're going to have bad games here and there, and we walked away with a win. But at the same time, it's got to be noted. That's so weird, because he was paired. I just looked at his pairing for that night, and he was with Tuomisto. And Tuomisto finished with a plus two. I thought maybe Rafferty, but Rafferty was a minus two. So it's a yeah. very, yeah, and so it's a, such a strange plus minus on that with the pairings. I was trying to figure it out well at the game because, you know, you, you let me disconnect quite a bit Friday night, so thank you. Um, well deserved, sir. <laughs> appreciate it. But with that, like, I was trying to figure it out and figure out the lines and kind of pay attention, and there wasn't, like, a blender. It just seems like Iowa was able to break out of their zone mid line change so much faster in this game than they were on Wednesday. And it caught Tuo out there quite a bit where he was on the ice in spots he shouldn't have been. <laughs> but at the end, end result, he was out there for goals. Like, yeah, two assists. Like, yeah, there was, I know for sure one point, one of the goals, I don't want, I think it was Majors, uh, the first goal of the game. Yeah, and it was mid line change where Iowa breaks out and he will force set turnover and follows the play into the zone, and they get the goal. So like he's not going to obviously force a turnover, turn around and get off the ice. Like, right, that's not Don't how that's going to work. So yeah, it was just they were a little out of sync Friday night on the defensive side of things, which I think is how Iowa ended up with three goals and how they were able to kind of get so many shots on goal. Defense was just out of sync. It happens. It's okay. And we still got to win. That's all that matters. You know, if, if this was a game where we the streak was broken on this game and the defense was out of sync, we might be saying some different words right now. But when your defense has bad nights and the offense can make up for it and the goaltending can make up for it, that's just showing the character of this team. One side of the ship can start sinking, but the other side can keep it afloat. You know, it's all, it's all that it's matters all when you're balance. talking about playoffs. It's all, I knew he was going to say it. <laughs> Knew he was going to say it, but I don't know. Final thoughts from you on this game so we can get into the uh, Saturday night fun. I, I've been very good at having good, like the feeling of the day is like, I thought going into this, it might end. And then we played not great. And I was like, they don't deserve to win this game. They're getting beat. They're getting out muscled. They're getting out shot. Like this is the one where it ends and they, they snuck it out and they got it. So, um, didn't have good feeling. I was like, this could be a trap game. Um, and on the Rockford, what I felt the same, well, I felt a little bit better about the Saturday game because Costa was starting, but it's good to see that Hutch bounce back. It's good to see Carter bounce back. Um, Bob had said somebody was out with an injury, so I just can't remember who that was. I thought it was Carter, but um, he had, he said somebody had a small injury and then they came back. Les Bruns was out for That's, this game. Okay. I was like, I Les Bruns had a small injury because he left he left the game briefly on Wednesday injured. Yeah. Uh, was holding his shoulder again, which I think has been what's nagging him all season long. Yeah. And yep. But he was he was back Saturday, so that was that was positive because we've we've talked about what he does bring to the table for this team. Um been god it's especially evident when he's at center yeah I'm he, he really, brings face off wins he brings that <laughs> i'm really started to like lesby a lot more this year than last i mean you know me i was a big les france guy last year and yeah he had a rough start to the season but he figured it out and again it's just everybody meshing and trying to figure each other out that's really all it was at the end of the day so Let's jump into whatever this chaos was on Saturday night as the Rockford Ice Hogs come to town and end up beating the Griffins 5-4 to four in overtime. I have so many thoughts and feelings about this game overall. And I think, I don't know if I said this on Friday night when I was at the game, because again, my days are blending. We were up 3 to nothing, and I think, the, I think Rockford scored, and I said, I've seen this movie before. 
I've seen yeah. this movie before. In the second period, something bad happens. And it actually turned out that it was in the, in the third period. It got worse. But, <laughs> you know. Anyways, let's dive into it here. So, like we said, Griffins we lose this one to? five. <laughs> we, we do. We do. <laughs> Griffins loses one five to four in overtime. Rockford outshoots Grand Rapids twenty six to four. Griffins do go one for five on the power play. Rockford goes one for seven on the power play. So PK again had a really good night with seven opportunities against him here. That was good. Coast gets the start in this one. Stops twenty one to twenty six. Not his best game, but I'm not going to fault him too much at the same time. Again, another night where the defense looked a little out of whack. Yeah, uh, but we'll talk about those guys. So goals in this one. Carter Mazer gets his 14th of the season, assisted by Zarnik and Bergen on the power play. Luff gets his first of the season in his, I don't remember how many games back this is for him, but he gets his first. Thank God he needed that one. And boy, was he excited to get that one in the net. That was assisted a sick by Astor. Goal. It was a sick goal. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about him specifically here. That was assisted by Aston Reese and Tua Misto. Uh, Marco Casper gets his 10th of the season, assisted by Berggren and Mazer. Rockford gets a bunch of goals in the middle of that. Les Perantz gets his 13th goal of the season. Thank God he was in this game. Uh, that was assisted by Gettinger and Luff. So Luff has a two-point night there. And uh, Del Mastrio ends up winning this game in overtime for Rockford with Lucas Reichel getting the assist on that one. So, again, talk about our goal scorers here. Carter Mazer, two point. Two point, or sorry, three point night before, and ends up getting the first goal in this game. Just dude, playing so well. We already we already were tooting the Carter horn for that. We don't need to do that for this. But what was good about this goal is it was a power play goal, and we both looked at each other and we're just like, finally, finally, a power play goal finds the back of the net. Yeah, I mean, it was a pass from that goal was a pass from Sarnik. So I mean, even Sarnik's getting back on the scoreboard as well in the stat sheet because he's been kind of quiet. Um, and we don't have stats for face-offs, which is probably where he's a lot better at, which <laughs> would bring us some more to talk don't about. Don't get me but. started already. <laughs> uh, but it was a tic-tac-toe. I mean, they put it right in the back of the net. Um, there was a couple chances that they had, but Mazer, like it it started at the back of the net. Uh, there was an open, pretty much backdoor play. Uh, they missed on that, and then it got circled back around, and that's when Mazer put it in um, from the right side. So it, it just, it was beautiful. Good passing. And that's the big thing that I've noticed the past two weeks is their passing has been so crisp. And it's like they're using it's one touch passing. We're seeing a lot more of that. It's a lot of passing off of the boards and into the play and uh, to the next player. And there's a lot of no look passes that have been going on, too. So like the team chemistry just from that angle and that aspect has just been so much better. Cause remember beginning of the season, it was like, they're passing the players, but there's nobody there. They're passing the space, but nobody's there last year. We could all read the passes and there was like, they were waiting to waiting and waiting to shoot. And it was just pass, pass, pass. And then nothing. So like, this is just a lot better of like, it reminds me a lot of soccer. I'm a huge soccer fan. I'm just like the passing, the one touch. And then like, Boom, there you go. Or the wings of the 90s, if you guys remember that. Um, just the possession style and passing. Like it's just it's there with this team. So um Mazer being able to finish it on that was just wonderful. Yeah, and that passing just shows the confidence and also how comfortable they are with each other now at this point. Like we didn't see that for the first 15 games of the season. No way. No. That stuff wasn't happening. But that is good to see there. So all right, the next goal, Matt Luff. It's his first. And if you saw the play on Twitter or watched the full replay through, because at first we thought the camera didn't catch this. Matt Luff makes an incredible individual effort at center ice to knock this puck down, get it through a Rockford guy's legs and be able to go in on Wallstead and buries this one. And that guy has been shooting the puck constantly since he's been back in the lineup, trying to find the back of the net. You can tell like he needed it. He wanted it. He finally got it, man. And, that was just such a good feeling right there. It was weird to hear a different goal song finally because I got so used to some of the few we've heard. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a new one we haven't heard yet. And uh, yeah, it was just a, such a good individual play by him. I mean, you can't knock, you know, two of me so getting it over to Zach Aston Reese to get the breakout started. And Aston Reese kind of threw it up to center. But Luff just makes that play happen. Without Luff, that play is not happening. That goal is not going in. And this is a different storyline. So. Beautiful goal by him. Happy to see him finding his way in the offensive side. It only took three or four games, so it's good stuff. 
probably the, the sickest goal I've seen live. <laughs> There's your answer. There's uh, Randy for him to knock that out of the air. I think it was just a dump in play and he just knocks that out and just takes it in. Like it was just, it was sick. I was pissed at first because I was like, they didn't show that play. Like the, the camera, the Grand Rapids have upgraded their camera uh, view angles. And so, uh, which is good for the organization. They're still trying to figure out how to use that other angle. But it's it missed that on the original replay, and uh, we were both disappointed in it because that it was sick. Yeah, it's a six game back. Sorry, I, I wanted to make sure I got that correct. That it was six games, but he got it. That's all that mattered to me. It was it was it was so sick. Like he, he made that play at center. I think we both just looked at each other. And went, Ooh, <laughs> like <laughs> oh, he, he did that. That poor that defenseman has a family. Like <laughs> my god, oh, it was good stuff. Well, the next goal for the Griffins here, we're going to put him up 3-0. Marco Casper gets his 10th. Dude, this this goal was sick, too. This goal was so sick. Like, seeing this kid continue to just elevate his play game after game after game. If only he could elevate the face-off dot at the same time that he is finding the back of the net, man. But, again, this one, this, this is where I thought the Griffins were going to start running away with this one. The vibes were good because this was the start of the second period, about five minutes in. And I was like, all right, up 3 nothing. Coast is in that. I'm feeling good. Obviously, it went sideways after that. But your thoughts on this one? Uh, yeah, I mean, Casper's just going to the net. Like, that's the biggest thing. And then he just – he has his stick down on the ice and gets it over the goalie. Like, that's the – so important, have stick on the ice. Um, and just continually going with the play. So um, it's good to see him continually, like, getting rewarded for his play. Uh, we said at the beginning of the season, like we couldn't find him. We didn't know where he was at. And now it's like, he was doing more of the physical things, like going to the corners, punching guys, <laughs> hitting guys. And now he's finishing on that score line. So it's, uh, it's good to see. And it gives us a lot more confidence of, of where he's at and how he's going to be utilized moving forward. I do think he needs one more year here next year for a full season before moving up. So I think that's kind of be kind of my timeline for everybody coming in now is two years here and then move up. The amount of shit he was causing in this game, I'm shocked he had zero penalty minutes. I'm yeah. shocked with how this game went. He was an absolute pest in this game, and I loved every second of it. It was so good to see. Like that, he got under their skin so quickly. And he he just he did the Mo Sider, he did the Simon Edmondson, he did the Albert Hudson. He's just laughing at him. He's just smiling at him. Like, yeah, what are you gonna do? Nothing exactly. So good to see him again. Continue to score there. Again, Mazer had the assist on that one too. So there's a two point night for him after a three point night the night before. Did a game after getting benched. Kudos, Carter. Well done, sir. Well done. Well, Rockford goes ahead and scores uh, four goals. We won't talk about that. Um, yep. <laughs> We'll fast forward to uh, Lesperance tying the game, thank God, at the 17-minute, 19-second mark of the third. And, dude, Lesperance has been clutch before and continues to be clutch. And this goal right here was the definition of clutch. Yeah, Les becoming in a clutch. I mean, there's three minutes left, less than three minutes left of the game. And uh, at this point, like, the game's out of hand. Like, there was one, two, three, three penalties for Rockford. And at this point, I'm like, okay, Kosa's not letting another goal in at this point. Like, he gets it in with three minutes left on the power play, winding down. And I'm like, okay, good vibes. We're back in this. Like, this game got out of hand in the second, and now we're going to finish it up, and we're going to sneak out of here with a win. Because, like, I don't know. It, just, it was just a weird game, the way it was handled and everything else. But we'll get into that in a second. Yeah. I mean, again, getting that game tied, like that's the point where I was like, okay, the point streak's at least secured. Like, cool, we got that. The coast is not going to let another one into regulation. They're going to shut things down and get back to their good defensive ways here and, and keep this clean. And, I mean, unfortunately, before we get into how the game was handled, overtime happens, and we, we, we said this in the tweet, you know, when we posted the goal by Rockford, this is why we think the face-off circle is so important for Grand Rapids right now. And they're struggling. Marco Casper gets beat on this face-off. And watching it back a couple of times, he he gets beat, but he looks like he wins the battle. But again, it's just the support from the players around him coming in to help on the face-off. He doesn't have that. But again, in three-on-three, three, you can't really do that because you get a guy in on the face-off there to help him. And they both get knocked down. The other team's got a two or three on one the other way. Like Casper's got to be able to out muscle his guys. 
he's up against in overtime there to be counted on in those situations to be able to do that because Rockford wins that face off. They, they pick it up, take it down, and score immediately. Like there was no in between anything else. They walked right in, scored, game over. Like that's a concern. And we've noticed it more and more. Like the veteran players in the face off dot for this team, fantastic. No complaints. Tim Gettinger has been slotting in at center sometimes, doing really well. Les Bronze has been great in the face off circle. Zarnik. Zarnik is just money in the face-off dot. Like, there's no other player right now on this team that is as, as consistent as him at the face-offs. The kids are struggling. And yeah, and it's it's just those guys on the wing because, like, well, we've watched Ammo win the face-off and then they give it up. <laughs> like, there's nobody there to support him on that side to be able to get the puck when he does win it. So, it's hopefully next year it's not something that we're going to continue to talk about throughout the season of face-offs but uh it's, they've got to change something because we can like the playoffs are change this up. year man yeah. we, we're not gonna win playoff games if you're doing face-offs like that like yeah that possession is so crucial so crucial and, and if we to see it we, go down like that oh and if we could get the stats like just to be able to help back up what we what we're seeing like I think that would go a lot further, and I don't know how we could get those because so, some, some teams, teams do a lot. it. Some, some teams, teams do, and some teams don't. Yeah, we're one of the ones that don't. I mean, we've heard it before, and you know the coaches show that they do in the pregame. We've heard it on road games when we're listening to the full broadcast, and you know we've heard Dan talk after some games, be like, "Yeah, we were as a team thirty-seven percent or thirty-four percent in the faceoff dot the night before," and you're like, "There, you're, you're talking thirties? Like, how consistent is that happening?" That's what I would love to know is like, how consistently are we in the t- high 20s and mid 30s in the face off for a full game and yet still on an 18 game point streak? Like if they can figure that part out, that's only going to help the power play get better. That's going to help in overtime. these overtime situations because, yes, we're on this point streak. But a lot of those games that went to extra time, we didn't walk away with a win. And this is just another one of those. I mean, our overtime losses are continuing to stack up on the season points wise for us. That's that's what's crazy. I mean, we have six overtime losses on the season. That's some of the most in the AHL. You know, there's a couple teams with nine, a couple teams with seven, but oh, six is up there. So I think points can be a big swing too for us. In this division, especially six points can be a major, major swing. We we know what's gonna we know we're gonna probably make the playoffs, right? That's almost a guarantee at this point. We don't want to play the stupid three game play in round. Right. We don't want to have to do that because there's a chance you look at that that we're playing Rockford. And Rockford's been a tough team for us. Oh. There's a chance they're playing Manitoba. There's a plan you're playing chance you're playing Chicago. I don't think you're playing Iowa in that play in round at this point. Or the Moose. No, Manitoba's fifth in the division right now. They move they jumped Chicago today. Oh, geez. Again, that's how stupid this division is. It's so close. You look at bottom of the division is 43 points with Chicago and Iowa, 44 points Manitoba, then 55 Rockford. There's a 10-point gap at least there. Thank God. And uh, we're at 63 points. So we're feeling a lot better than where we were at the beginning of the season. But at the same time, like you've got to be able to secure those extra time wins. You do. You have to, especially you know, in the playoffs. You know who was our overtime winner last year? Who? Pontus Andreas. <laughs> yeah, but our center depth was a little better last year, too. Not that our centers are bad. They're just bad at the face-off. They're good at everything. They're fantastic at everything else. They just suck at the face-off. And, you know, again, every time we sit here and we recognize a problem, it's usually fixed in two weeks because Dan Watson and the coaching staff are so far ahead of it by the time anyone with a non-coaching brain recognizes what's happening in front of them on the ice. They're like, oh, yeah, we're already on it. I'm sure it's already a big, big practice focal point. I bet you three on three play is right now, and I bet you face offs are. And probably the power play. Like those are gonna be your main focuses. And if referee Jackson Kazari is ever our referee again, we better be good on the power play and the penalty kill. Because my God, this was this was terrible. So he ref the game Friday night, and there was multiple times where we're watching and the people were sitting around and we're like Okay, this ref's not seeing the game at all happen in front of him. The other guy is the only guy making calls. That's the craziest part. You see a play happen, and you're like, he was blatantly just held or tripped in front of you. And Jackson's like, 
Huh? And the other guy at center ice is raising his hand finally to make the call. The other guy wasn't there Saturday night. Jackson was again. And what a piss poor managed hockey game this was across the board. Yeah. For this officiating staff. And it's not that we're pissed that Grand Rapids was called for penalties. It was just so poorly managed. Like, I knew it was lost at the point where Kaiser and Johansson go at it in the corner after Johansson lays a really nice hit. And uh, they both get called for roughing out of this. Johansson lays the hit and just stands there. He gets pushed around. Kaiser drops the gloves. And Johansson's standing there, just getting tugged at and pushed. Both those guys go for roughing. No other extras or anything like that. Then Berggren, later on in the game, hooks a guy. Yep, call that every day. It was a blatant hook. You got to call that. These two go at it. Berggren gets called for roughing out of this somehow. Don't know how. Again, another situation where the guy is punching Berggren, and Berggren is taking it. They're doing the thing that Dan Watson and this coaching staff preach. Don't give in to this. Don't play to their game. Don't get the extra call. And somehow out of this, Berggren is the only one that gets called for roughing. And I think he made his point very clear and ends up getting an extra 10 for abusive officials. Well done, Kirky. Well, you said Kaiser did get a roughing on that too. Two minutes against Berg. Oh, he did. Yeah. But Bergie gets the roughing as well and gets the extra 10. Like, <laughs> did the ref's feelings get hurt? Like, Bergen said everything that all 8,344 fans in the arena were saying too. The ref sucked. That's the strongest ref you suck chant I've ever heard out of Van Andel in a long time. It was crazy. It, it was a packed game. Like there was a, people were like people were out. They were vocal. They were very into this game. But that's the that's the unfortunate part is like you have games where the Griffins are just dominant and the fans get brought into it because we're just tearing it up. Or you have these close games that the fans get really into it because every single move on the ice matters. But the majority of the games this season where the fans get dragged into it is because the officiating is so bad that even like people who are just trying to understand what's happening on the ice in front of them, they might be new to hockey or like, yeah, even I can see this is terrible. And, you know, Dan Watson said it before, you know, you have your two to three thousand dedicated fans, your season ticket holders they are at every game. They understand the game of hockey and you're out there trying to trying to reel in another five thousand people in your game. When that. It's so poorly managed like that. All you're doing is just hurting the, the future game. fans of this game. You're hurting the game. You're making it worse. And we're going to sound like total homers at this point because of how many more opportunities that Rockford had. But as soon as Berggren ran his mouth at the ref and said everything we wanted to say, every single thing the Griffins did was either interference or cross-checking. The next four penalties are interference on Luff, BS call. A terrible call. Shine for cross checking. Shine hits a guy who happens to run it into Zach Aston Reese, who's also skating up, and it looks like Shine just obliterated him, but it wasn't a cross check. There was no cross checking. He hit him. It wasn't a cross check. Didier, cross checking. Next call. There's three back to back cross checking calls, two of them on Dominic Shine. Four total the game. feelings. What's that? Four total cross checking penalties in that game. Yeah, all on Grand Rapids. <laughs> if you're wearing a Griffin's uniform and you touch the other guy, call it for cross checking. Guaranteed. And like these were those four penalties there after the Bear Grin stuff, because the Bear Grin stuff happened late in the second period. Those four, sorry, those three penalties, the interference, cross check, cross check, were all still in the second period as well. There was a five on three opportunity the Griffins had to deal with and killed off. Like it was just back to back to back to back. BS, stupid. Just like if your feelings got hurt, you shouldn't be a referee. I'm sorry. If little Berggren said something in Swedish that pissed you off, oh well, deal with it. And like, it's not just that. Like, I saw that ref get emotional in the Friday night game because he had called an Iowa penalty and the Iowa guys in the box complaining to him, and the ref slammed the penalty box door on him. He was refing emotional. Yeah. He like he he did and he there there was one part he got hit by one of the Rockford players he got punched in the face the referee did and I'm like you're not you're gonna keep him in the game you're not gonna toss him nope he's just two minutes roughing blah, blah, blah. 
Like Kaiser had two penalties for roughing for two minutes. He went after out. There was one point that they jumped Albert Johansson. Two guys were on him, and Albert out of that one got what? Uh, he didn't get. Yeah, he got the roughing for two minutes. Yeah, uh, nobody. Uh, and Kaiser got the two minutes too, but nobody else. It just. It was so ticky tacky what they were calling at Grand Rapids, but then they weren't calling the same things with Rockford, like holding the stick, then it turned around, the cross checks, the hits. Like it was a physical game. And as soon as, like, I hate these games against Grand Rapids because we've lost, I believe we've lost both games that there's penalties like this like crazy. I think the one we did win was the Belleville, the Toasters game, was the only <laughs> game that, yeah. come, that comes to mind. But like overall, out of all the games we played, there's been like three that the rest have been terrible at, like noticeably terrible. And it's always the games where they they, they lose control of the game, and then yep. they just start calling penalties like crazy on every like on us, which I don't understand. And I know I, I was looking through some of the other highlights for Grand Rapids, and um, Dan Watson did talk to the officials at the start of the third period, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if they did send in some game notes for this and. Uh, you, you don't see these rust back here at Grand Rapids because it, it was a terribly officiated game. It was just, it was out of control. If you're going to set the, if you're going to try to gain control of the game, you need to be able to hit both, both teams evenly. You're like yep. it, at the same time, like, yeah, Dan went and had that conversation with him and props to Dan for not going off. I, mean, I would have lost my cool. He had a respectful conversation with him. And then two minutes later, Shine gets called for cross checking again. Like, <laughs> Like I knew this was going to be a shit game officiating wise when Simon Edmondson got that holding the stick call at the beginning of the game. It was 11 minutes in the first period. He gets called for holding the stick. It looked nothing like that. Simon gets out of the box, skates into the zone and starts playing and a Rockford guy literally grabs the blade of his stick and holds him back and yanks him yeah. in front of the ref. And Simon turns around and he's skating to the bench, looking at him, both hands in the air like, dude, what are you doing? And we got a soft makeup roughing call maybe two minutes later from that. It was a really soft one on their end. They you got dumb Astro really wasn't doing much there, and they called him for that. And then they got Cini on a hook. Like they tried to make up for it, and then they just lost control after that. Yeah, it was out of control. Out of control. It's just I hate games like this. I, I literally do. And it's not it like ruins it, man. It just like I was happy that the point streak continued, but it was not the way it should have. Like to see that loss when we were up four to one, wasn't it? Three to one. And then for Rockford to come back and score three straight in under two minutes. Like the it, first one they scored was a power play goal. Yeah. It's just, just defeating. And like, Kosa, it, I don't think Kosa played a bad game. I really don't. I don't put this loss on him. No, oh. I, I think it was just a, a blip. And I knew it was going to happen at some point, right? Like the most important thing was to continue to get points. Sucks yeah. to give one up to Rockford, and we play Rockford. We play Rockford four more times. So it, it yeah, it, like I don't know. It's just this is a tough team for us. We haven't been able to figure out like their play style physically, and I think they just took advantage of it, you know. But with that, any final thoughts on the Griffins weekend from you, sir? I was really happy to pick up a uh, belt bag. You know, Indiana Jones yeah. wears one, so I uh, figured I'd have to grab one. I'm really excited for uh, the next Friday game that I go to to see how many hot dogs I can stash in here. So uh, there's a positive on that. <laughs> um, and we got playoff primer back on the HL standing. So I'm, I've am i been watching that a little bit and trying to understand a little bit more because the, the playoffs are crazy with the HL, especially with this division because it's what, seven teams make it? For this division, five of the seven make it. So I, I know we got a comment on one of our po like one of our uh, videos on YouTube of like how does that work and like how does how does yeah. So I, we need to break that down and make make it make sense. Yeah. Do we want to do maybe that not today? this episode? Okay, you're good. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, we did get the comment. We saw it. we will break it down post trade deadline. We will break down what the playoffs mean in the AHL, how that works. What the divisions are, we'll, we'll break it all down and make it make sense. Let's let this week settle down. This episode already ran long enough just with the chaos of this weekend, and we have to literally turn around the Griffins play in Cleveland today when this episode posts. They play Monday in Cleveland. 
Could be an interesting game. Jet Greaves, the Cleveland goaltender that uh, usually gives us hell, got called up to Columbus today. So that might create some interesting storylines there. But at the same time, uh, the Cleveland Monsters are a fantastic hockey team that usually is a tough one for us to play against. It is usually a wild game. Yeah, it's always some. There's always some controversy. Always, always something crazy that happens, and you know we take on a Cleveland team that, as of recent, you know they're six one one and two in their past ten right now. That's uh, it's not bad, not bad. We're six zero oh, two and two, still on our eighteen game point streak, and uh, we'll we'll see what happens. What's well, the record? Course, their record total? No, what's the record for like point streak? So, I mean, on top of all of this with this game and our streaks that we're on right now, we're on 18 points now. The team record is 19. That was set back in 2015. And that, ironically, that March, that run went from February 4th to March 20th. Interesting. That's we're weird. really good in, this, in, the, <laughs> in the second half of the season, man. That is, uh, is what, our, what we do. Yeah, exciting stuff coming up this week. Like again, the Griffins play Cleveland Monday. We'll have a recap of that for Thursday's episode with maybe a special guest. Who knows? Uh, one we've been wanting to get on the podcast in a while. I don't know. I'm not telling you. You're not going to know who's coming. With that recap of the weekend, there we will send it over to DraftKings, meet our obligations there, and then after the ad, we have a nice little interview with Katie, a contributor for the Octopus Thrower. Uh, she just released a new article recently on Jonathan Berggren, so we're going to talk about that and some other stuff. She's got some insight on some other players in the team as well. So, Nick, go read the ad, and then we'll send it over to Katie. We know hockey games move fast, but with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL, you can score faster than anything happening on the ice. This week, new customers can bet 5 bucks to get 200 instantly in bonus bets. With Patrick Cade, Alex Debrinkit all back and ready for from the All-Star game, you've got good choices to make bets on them. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use code THPN. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get 200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of Super Bowl 58 with code THPN. The crowd is yours. Problem. Call 1 800 Gambler or visit www1800 Gambler.net in New York. Call 8778 Hope NY or text Hope NY 467369 in Connecticut. Help available for problem gambling. Call 888 789 7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Bill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. CDKNG.com slash football for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. <music> All right, and we're back with Katie from the Octopus Thrower. So uh, you've, or well, we've connected a little bit. We talked last week and uh, just audio issues and everything else. So we uh, brought you back this week. We wanted to be able to give you uh, a platform and be able to talk. Um, you do a lot of writing for the wings and a lot of, uh, after talking with you, you brought a lot of interesting perspectives with um, the Denver kids and with Jonathan Berrigan, which you just put an article out. So uh, I'll let you go through and uh, kind of give you the space right here, Katie. Thank you. And I appreciate you having me back on. And um, hopefully this audio works a little bit better than last time, better set up. If you hear anything, I do have my dog in here with me, Taro. Um, so he's off to the side, hopefully going to stay quiet. Um, but thanks again for having me. So I did release the article um, as a comp- contributor to the Octopus Thrower um, about Jonathan Berggren. And I know a lot of people are expecting him to get traded and I'm kind of getting you know, prepared um, for the worst, but I'm hoping he stays. But my article was centered around why he should stay from both perspectives of the Red Wings and from possibly Berggren's perspective. Um, because I see a lot of people and, and why we should trade him and that he's unhappy. Um, I've read that he's had attitude issues, which is news to me. Um, I mean, I don't know him personally, but I've been following him since he was drafted and I've never heard anything like attitude issues. I've heard he's too goofy at times and too silly and he might not take things seriously enough. Um, but I mean, when you when you look at it, like he's still chasing some of the most unbelievable stats in the SHL. Now in the AHL, he's doing exceptionally well last year when they were not a great team and not well coached or structured or anything. He was still, um, you know, beaten. I think it was Timu Polkinen's record for most points by a rookie. So like, yes, he has fun, but the fun is kind of a cloak for 
his effectiveness and that's that's what he does and i actually thanked him personally um for bringing the fun because a lot of people underestimate that and they think it's just a joke but in reality like when you have fun usually better things happen um when you're not having fun that's usually when crap hits the fan um so i really appreciate that about burger and and i think the red wings and the griffins kind of need more of that um i know they have Walman up in grand rapid or in detroit and he's fun um and you, and you have other guys like you know having a good time but i don't think you can have too many of them um and i don't think we have a lot in the pipeline of what bergren can do um young guys we have you know the larkin raymond um and a couple other guys who can step in at times of course kane to bring it and that sort of thing but this new wave we have lombardi um kind of similar where he can get the zone entries and keep the puck a little bit but i think Bergeron's a little bit more like that Perron structure where he's he can hold on to the puck a little bit longer. He can win those one-on-one -on -one battles a little more um, when he feels like it, when he wants to. So I really appreciate that aspect of his game, and I don't think we have too many with the flair possibilities that what he can do. Um, he always says he's not a goal scorer, but he knows how to score a goal, even if it's with his eyes closed. Like he said at one point that he's not a goal scorer, so he just closes his eyes and throws the puck on the net. Um, I think there's more to it. I think he's just more intuitive where he can't really explain it. He just knows where to go, where to be, um, what to do. And so I think those are big aspects of his game that we need. Um, and then from his perspective, I think a lot of what the Red Wings can offer him is possibly hitting his highest ceiling, like possibly a ceiling that I didn't even think was possible with the DeBrinkets and the Canes and the Raymonds and just seeing how Raymond responds to that environment. Um, I think it's doing Bergeron a disservice a little bit to be in Grand Rapids right now because he could learn so much from these guys uh, that he can actually grow his game. Whereas when Grand Rapids, he's the guy, um, but I mean, the Griffins need him more than he needs the Griffins right now. Um, and so in all fairness, I think he really does deserve a spot and he should be there at least practicing and learning from these guys. And even if it's like a third, line roll and it's maybe 10 to 12 minutes a night and even without the power play time i think having those practices playing against those guys and learning from them um i think he might actually see more growth because i'm not sure he even knows where his ceiling's at because i think he right now is frustrated which is understandable i'm frustrated for him um so i just i kind of hope he gives it just a little bit more time and i hope um, Iserman and company give him a chance because they haven't really given him that. They've given it to him in spots and parts, um, but he hasn't been given as much chance, I would say, as like a Rasmussen or a Valeno. Um, so I, I hope in the future that they change that for him. Yeah, the, the biggest thing that we always get on the pod, like people tweeting and commenting in is uh, pull him up, bring him up, bring him <laughs> up. And it's like, well, he doesn't fit like where do you see him re right. who do you see him replacing for the wings because like we have so many good veterans and like if Kane Patrick Kane didn't sign with Detroit that's where mm -hmm. Bergen was because once Patrick Kane signed you didn't see Bergen bear well you didn't see Bergen being moved up at all right. at that before Patrick Kane was was here with Detroit he was going back and forth every weekend to Detroit mm -hmm. and playing those games so like if we don't resign like the Daniel Sprague we don't resign mm -hmm. Joe Valeno is up for a contract this year, I believe. Uh, Costin, I believe, is up for a contract as well. Like, who do you see him taking that place of? No, oh, people are not going to like me for saying it. Um, <laughs> because I, I love this player. I, honestly, like I was talking uh, to Jordan Harris on Twitter. I was like, I genuinely love like every single player. Kane, I'm still coming around to on the personal side of things, but like, I genuinely like this team like years past like if you got rid of a guy or two i'm like cool that's fine i don't you know i i don't yeah. sleep over it but these guys like they have heart they play hard every night for the most part and like you can see it and i i really appreciate it and i don't want to see anybody go because they're so great but for me um sprague is definitely a candidate but then the other one is fabry um robbie fabry i i like him a lot um but i think Bergen can fill a lot of the same things that either of those players do. And I think he's a little bit younger. He has a little bit more to learn and he's a little bit more, um, 
I would say like I would give him the edge over one of those two, um, if not both, because I feel like you kind of have to make a spot for him. Um, Costin, honestly, the role he's in right now, and he probably won't come back next year because all the things that are happening where he's just not playing, um, and that's fair. But I don't think he's really a factor in it because of the role he plays anyways isn't one that Berggren would really play in. So I think for him, like if he does come back, like the way he's playing is fine. Like Fisher, I don't think has an impact either. Um, I think it would have to be like a Fabry or a Sprong or one of those um, that he would have to come in and take the spot of. Now the is question it... is, oh, go ahead. Oh, oh, no, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say who does, who takes his spot in Grand Rapids is the other question. Um, but for me, like the biggest thing is, is Bergeron right now, like what is best for him, um, and his development. I think it's kind of, it's not going to get stunted, but I don't think there's going to be growth like there would be if he were in the NHL. Yeah. Like I definitely don't think he should be here next year, like mm -hmm. in the Grand Rapids the team, he should be moved up at that point. Like he's, he's well, almost a point per uh, game player mm -hmm. right now. He, the whole offense is really him right now like he's he's leading the team in scoring he's doing so well so it's like okay we lose okay let's hypothetically he gets traded friday or before friday who takes that spot because we i mean we have a couple guys like matt luff came back so we're looking at mm -hmm. like maybe matt luff replaces him you know uh if if the wings make a trade if fabry goes or you know uh sprong goes you bring Bergy up like those are the guys that kind of we keyed in on as well a couple weeks a couple months ago mm -hmm. so like now you lose Bergy, now who do you pull up like because that creates a hole and i i think a lot mm -hmm. of like the red wings podcast like they don't look at it as both teams like we're mm -hmm. going to the playoffs like the playoff primer is up we're ranked second uh second seed right now so you lose somebody like him that that's a huge hole for us or like even simon mm -hmm. same same spot and, and I agree. Um, I think Simon stands to gain more from Grand Rapids, though, in a playoff run, whereas I, um, I, that's what comes kind of back to the whole, I think Grand Rapids needs Bergeron more than Bergeron needs Grand Rapids. Like he, he could stay there and he could do well and he would do exceptionally well. But I don't, I mean, he'll learn some stuff from playoffs. He'll grow a bit from playoffs. Is that more than he would learn from DeBrinket, from Kane, from Larkin, from Raymond? I don't think so. Um, I don't think he's at a point where playing, you know, even to the Calder Cup finals, it, it'll do something for him. But I think even with a first round exit in the playoffs with a Kane and a DeBrinket and those types of players, even like playing against Sherratt in practice or um, whatever it might be, Cider in practice, I think he'd grow more from that experience than he would from a Calder Cup run. And that's just my opinion. It, and Simon's a bit different. He's him and even Albert Johansson. They're kind of separate. Like I, I can see where they could take more time and they could grow and they can learn in the AHL. Um, but I think it's a little bit different for Berger. And I think he's, He's pretty much tapped out. He can kind of level up, but I don't think it'll be as impactful as it could be in the NHL. Yeah, I would agree. Because they said defensemen, like goalies take the longest, defensemen mm -hmm. are the next, and the forwards are pretty quick. And you see this development with Lucas Raymond. Like we, we mentioned mm -hmm. on the last episode, or I think it was one of the last episodes, is that you saw Patrick Kay come in and Lucas Raymond just shoots right up. Like right. the amount of development there. And so Bergie could use that development on that side. Um I want to go back though, as you said, uh, Bergy doesn't play that kind of role that Costa does. But these last few games, he kind of has. <laughs> He's growing into that like a little bit more physical side there, uh, which has been definitely <laughs> interesting. So, I mean, do you think that's another element that helps him, or is this something he's working on, or like where do you? <laughs> Great question tonight. I mean, it could be. It very well could be. I think he's just more so frustrated than just in general. Like he, since he's been returned to Grand Rapids, he's kind of had an edge that I haven't really seen too much of. Like I did see him Sweden. He cross checked two guys in the face because uh, he was frustrated. So I've seen it in like spurts, but never like it's this. Where it's, kind of, it's kind of building and it's it's kind of exploding now into this like where I just don't care. And I think that's part of it too. Um, like he's he's just like visibly frustrated. 
with what's going on. And I think that's maybe part of where the, the whole attitude thing comes into play, possibly, where he seems like he has a poor attitude, but he's just frustrated. And he just, that's his outlet is, you know, breaking things, including people's faces or, or trying to, um, or <laughs> throw him to the ice. I, I was actually impressed. I was like, that was Bergie last night. We threw that guy to the ice. I was like, wow, I haven't seen him do that before. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely adding a different element. Um, and it's it's interesting. We, we've been calling him the spicy burger lately. So uh, because of how feisty he is. But um, do oh, you what was I going to say? I had a question. Um, and you could tell like he he's having fun with it. Like the Rocky thing when Simon took the guy down at the toasters yep. night. Um, I mean, he's 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 the big thing we've been hearing, too, from a lot of the other players is he is a big chirper. And so, like, that's been getting into it um, with the one last night with the officials, but then again with the rest of the, the rest of the teams. But um, and they 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 said this they said this weekend that he did reject a contract um, offer by the Red Wings. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I've heard different stories of eh, we might as well trade him, uh, you know. But then I've also heard don't read too much into it because everybody rejects that contract. I mean, it's something you mm-hmm. see him. Uh, staying with, I mean, if you had to put, <laughs> I would have put you on a spot. Do you think he stays with us <laughs> past the trade deadline? I, I mean, I hope so. I kind of, I mean, I noticed, I don't know when he changed his like Twitter picture, uh, but I noticed recently it's a different one because it used to be his Red Wings. I don't know how recent that is, and I don't know how much to read into that kind of thing. But now it just says a Swedish hockey player. It doesn't mention Red Wings, but then you see him. Um, like in a lot of videos that the Griffins put out and like um, interviews, he's wearing Red Wing stuff. So I'm like, if he was really that mad, I don't know if he'd do those things. But from what I'm hearing, he is that upset, which I mean, honestly, I I see why. Like I, I'm upset for him. Um, would he come back? <sighs> it's hard to say because it's, I mean, what, what else does he need to do to get a full-time NHL spot? Um, is my question. And is he going to be able to do that between now and next season and where he earns that spot? And like, what, what isn't he doing right now to get that spot? Is it genuinely because they don't have a spot for him? Well, how are they going to create that between now and then? Um, And so, so for me, I think that's the most thing, important thing is the roadmap to the NHL for him. And if what, what that entails and why he's still in Grand Rapids, because I, I mean, I'm kind of at a loss, too. I know his defensive side isn't that great. Um, and maybe that's what he's supposed to be focused on. But he hasn't even expressed he's working on certain things. He says he's just confident in his game and he just needs the opportunity. So I don't know who to believe. Fans, like, yes, I, I understand that he needs to work on his defensive side. Um, but in his eyes he's saying you know nothing seems to be needed in his game and that he's ready for the nhl and if that is true and there is that disconnect then i assume eiserman will pull the trigger and just send him on his way um, yeah, he's not an eiserman pick so i mean it is something like there's no connection there for him and right. when that came out for he like wasn't so great defensively like we've been watching him and he back checks like crazy and he's right. like He's grabbing the puck. He's all over people and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, on all ends of the ice. So um, I think he's clear. I'm hoping he's shed that reputation as well. But yeah, like, I mean, in the beginning, it was a lot of he just sits at the offensive zone. He's that's where he's at. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I kind of get that. But then it's like, I mean, in the NHL, yeah, you have to play a one round of game, but it's like, I mean, I still, I still don't know what he has to do. I don't know. Um, I don't know if he knows. I would assume he knows, um, and he just doesn't want to share it or doesn't feel like he needs to do whatever it is he's saying. But then, his play has been a lot better as of late. Um, and I mean, looking at the wings yesterday, we went to the game, unfortunately, and it was like they needed, <laughs> they needed that spark. They needed something. And whenever Bergen was with the Red Wings, or whenever Bergen goes out on the ice for the Griffins, like when they're having an issue it's kind of like Fisher that energy bringing the the team into the fight kind of thing where they they just need that spark to get going um like he's not going to drop the gloves he's not gonna probably lay anybody out for the most part uh, maybe <laughs> maybe he does but for the most part I think he's gonna do it with 
hard play kind of like when he was with the Red Wings and he got those energy guys up and going and um, playing hard again because they sometimes go to sleep and I think he's one of those people that can fill that role really well. Um, I mean, I hope he stays. I don't know if he will. Um, at, at this point, it, it's more of a 50-50 to me. Like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Um, I would, I'll, I'll lean towards my positive energy and just say, yes, he's going to stay. Um, just cause that's what I want to happen. I think in a perfect world for me, he stays. And like you said, one of the trade options there would be Fabry. I have nothing against Fabry, but mm -hmm. in point comparison and for locker room presence, I think Sprong and his experience has to stay. Mm -hmm. through at least this playoff series and you trade a guy who's fourth in points in the team ahead of the playoffs. I think that sends a bad message to the locker room, but a Fabry option, if you can get the right thing for him, yeah, you move Fabry and Bergeron gets his shot up there. And then at that point, you know, the big question mark of what happens in Grand Rapids, who comes here? And I think that's where you start looking at guys like Alexander Doucette, get them and the fourth line experience here and bump guys up like an Elmer Soderblom who's having more consistent hockey games lately. Or, you know, let the other veteran guys be able to step in and do a little bit more. So it, the pieces are there to not deplete both teams necessarily. But, I mean, Deuce and Perky would be a big hit to Grand Rapids and Toledo. But I think in a perfect world, that's what I see come across the ticker on Friday is Bergen's going to stay, but Babs, unfortunately, is the casualty and he's going to go. It's and hard to say. <laughs> it is, it's tough. No fan's going to like the answer. No. Everyone right. likes all these players. That's the problem is now we all have right. attachment issues to all of them. And uh, mm -hmm. Steve's going to break our hearts. But at the same time, we understand it's it's business and mm -hmm. it is what it is. But I think statistically, if you go by that in the eye test as well, that move makes a ton of sense. Because yeah. Fergie, yeah, like you said, he'll get a little bit from a Calder Cup run. He's not going to get a lot from an mm -hmm. NHL playoff run. Even if it's just one round, mm -hmm. he's going to learn a ton. Yeah. So switching gears a little bit, you also, so you were in Denver for a while, yeah. lived there and you caught a lot of, and I thought at first when you said this, I thought you were catching more of a Colorado games and I was like, oh, that's oh, gross, no. oh, no. <laughs> but you were more on the Denver, um, Denver college team. So what did you see? <laughs> what was your experience there? Cause they're, they were good for a long time. I don't know. I'm not up to speed with college hockey, uh, besides our ones here with, uh, Trey Augustine. Which we'll touch on later. Yeah, I, my sister and I, we had gone. The first college game that we went to out in Colorado was DU versus um, the Colorado Springs college team uh, in Colorado Springs, and it it honestly was one of the worst hockey games I've ever been to. And we left like through the second period. Um, it was my friend's first hockey game, and I was so excited to introduce her. And they were like, it was the last game of the season, so obviously, like it is realize it at the time, like they're not going to actually put effort in, but they really didn't put effort in. Um, but then after they drafted Booyam, um, and I don't know if Mazer was the same year, but they all went to Denver the same year, basically, um, with Empty Duomiso as well. And so I begged and pleaded, and my sister finally came, and we went up to Denver for the first Saturday game. Um, and then after that, we just went up there as often as possible because they were really, really good. Um, David Carl did an awesome job, with the exception of maybe Auntie Tuamisto's treatment towards the end of the season. But um, for the most part, they were super fun to watch um, and see how they started to where they ended. Um, the only one that we saw kind of take steps back were, was Tuamisto. Um, and I heard Bob Kayser on the, I think it was last night's game or the game, or it might have been both games, um, where he was kind of bragging on to Amisto skating, which I can see why. Um, but when I first saw Auntie's game, I was like, I don't know if there's even a professional hockey player there, like let alone NHL. Like I didn't even think NHL was going to be an op option for him um, just based on his skating, his play. It wasn't, it wasn't so great. Um, but to see where he was then um, and how he's developed his skating and his positioning and his reading of plays, um he's grown a lot like incredibly much like to the point where maybe he'll see a couple nhl games i don't know if there is an nhl guy there um but there's a chance and i i wouldn't have said that um i think it was 2018 maybe or no um 2020 ish maybe somewhere in there um 
when we saw them and they went on their actual run and we got to go to Loveland, Colorado and see them play in the playoffs. And that was super cool. I got to visit my other friend who hadn't really experienced too many hockey games and they won that handedly uh, as they showed off. So it was really fun to see them. Um, and then Mazer, he's always a fun one. I kind of like in his game. I know people like to compare him to Tyler Bertuzzi, but I kind of see more of the Vlad Nemesnikov in him um, where he is a shit disturber, but a little bit different. Um, and a little bit more of a playmaker and like a little bit different skill set, I would say, um, than Tyler Bertuzzi. Tyler's good at what he does, um, but Mazer's just a little bit different. He's definitely feisty, um, and I get get that comparison, but that's kind of where it ends for me. Um, he's a little bit better at skating, I would think, and just a little bit different of a hockey player, but he is a hockey player, like the definition. When you think of a hockey player, that's kind of sure what you would see um is his picture in the dictionary and then um as far as shy booyam he's kind of like he's the question mark the biggest question mark for me and any prospect that we have in our system um i haven't watched him much this season um but in seasons previously i just i wasn't sure i'm still not sure who he is as a player uh but he had a really great foundation started he can skate really well it's not as pretty as like a Simone Edmondson or um, Wallander or any of those guys but he can skate and he can do it pretty well um, he has a decent shot it's pretty accurate um, not the hardest but it, it definitely gets the job done um, and he's a decent playmaker he's kind of like kind of like Albert Johansson in a sense but he's a bit different too but similar skill set where he can kind of do a little bit of everything um and i'm still not sure where he's going to be and how he's going to top out but i'm kind of interested to see i'm hoping he gets a contract this summer um and that hopefully maybe he can come to detroit and learn from uh cronwell a bit even if cronwell's still in sweden but i really want to see his like you can see what cronwell does with like the ciders and the edmondsons and the johansons um i'd really like to see what he could do with Shai William because he is a really good foundation. I just don't know where he goes um, from Denver and how he progresses, but I'm really curious to see because he's a really good player. Well, hopefully if he comes here to Grand Rapids, I mean, you've got the two of the two of the best defensive coaches here, you know, Dan Watson That's and true. Brian Lashoff. So that would help his development as well. Um, yeah, he's, he doesn't get a whole lot of like recognition, Shai William. So I'm like trying to figure mm -hmm. out like, He's coming over next year. He's coming over. We've got uh, possibly Pelica. You've got right. a couple other Andrew Gibson uh, from mm -hmm. the O. So, I mean, we have so many people on the way up. Like the pipeline is pretty stacked uh, on the defensive side and now with centers. So um, it's interesting to know, you know, is there any other college guys that you're following or anybody else that you're, you know, I know Chai's, Chai's brother is over there in Denver as well, and he's one of the top prospects with top picks. Yeah, and I, I haven't seen too, too much. I saw some, I think it was World Juniors maybe, um, some of those games. He was interesting there. Um, we kind of touched on it last time where he's kind of like the bratty little brother um, where I saw him do some things, and I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> like, that is that is not how Shy plays. Like Shy plays a super mature, um, effective, and he can be physical and he can lay a hit. Like I got one of my favorite videos ever of him just laying out a guy at center ice. Like it was beautiful. <laughs> so he will hit. Like he he knows how to play that physical side. Um, but I I have not seen him be as undisciplined as his little brother. Um, <laughs> but his little brother is very good um, from what I'm hearing. Um, I did get to see a little bit of Red Savage a couple of times because they were in the same, I think, division. I don't I don't know how college hockey works, to be honest with you, but they played each other a lot. And um, Red Team did not do very well any of those times because I think they were the team, too, that they had to play to move on in the playoffs, if I remember correctly. But they only got, like, maybe five or six wins total that year, and it was bad, and it was Miami um, of Ohio University or something. So he wanted to play with his brother so that makes sense um thankfully he moved on to the michigan state because i um he's a really good player uh really fun kind of like mazer um maybe not as 
gifted in terms of like skill set, whereas Mazer maybe can play up and down the lineup um, as needed. Coach's favorite, though, the both are. Um, can definitely do PKs, wants to be a center, so that's great because we need centers. We don't have too many in the pipeline, so any centers um, are great. Um, he was always fun, though. I liked liked Red and Savage a lot. Um, and then I'm trying to think. We did go to, I think it was like the Four Nations tournament or something in Plymouth with um, Axel Sendin Pelika and um uh, Anton Johansson, which makes everything confusing when you see Johansson with the Red Wings mentioned, because I'm like, which one? And then you can't say A Johansson because they're both A. Um, <laughs> but Anton was fun. Um, unfortunately, the game we went to, Polika didn't play. Um, it was just Anton, and he did really good. Um, and I thought he looked decent when he wasn't, you know, getting kicked out of games and stuff for hitting people in the World Juniors. He looked good. <laughs> uh, I'm excited for Anton to come here. I, I don't think he's on the radar for a lot of wings. Um, I'm also, I was pretty high on Buchnikov last year and he's starting oh. to gain some steam too. So uh, over in Russia, Yay. I think he's got another year till he can come over here. So, uh, <laughs> but his types have been fantastic. But Anton, I'm like, he's a huge guy. It's going to be interesting if we could get him over here um, next year mm -hmm. and uh, maybe link him up with Albert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. defense but he's a huge dude and he mm -hmm. is willing to fight and drop the gloves so i i like that physicality uh, on our defense side and the griffins kind of need that next year so yeah uh, and go ahead I, oh i was just gonna tell uh, just a quick story when we we went to that arena I, we my sister never sat in the front row so i decided it would be a great idea to try that at that arena, which I would not recommend because um, there's no leg room whatsoever. And then you're like right on top of the glass. It was not, it was not great. We, we moved after the first period, but as we were going to sit down with our Red Wings gear, um, I didn't really know what Anton looked like. I heard we had drafted him, so I knew he was there. I didn't know what number it was, but I saw him and he saw us with our Red Wings stuff and he had the biggest smile on his face. And then he played like out of his mind that game. So it, just a fun little thing. Like he, he loves the fans. He loves the Red Wings. So he's definitely earned a lot of love in my heart. And he's, he's one I'm looking forward to for when he comes to Grand Rapids. Cause I think he'll be, he'll be fun. He'll be a fan favorite for sure. That's awesome. So you, you think he probably plays a lot like Cronwell then? A little bit, a little bit. Um, yeah. Kind of like an angrier version um, of <laughs> some of our younger guys. <laughs> kind of like Cider too. Not really, but, a little more angry, a little less disciplined, um, and obviously not the same skill levels, of course, because oh, yeah. where they get drafted and stuff. But like he, he, he has a chance. He's definitely fun. <laughs> That's a great that. story. <laughs> I love that. I love like we love the jersey bump. Yeah, uh, <laughs> anytime that we yep. like we get that, yep. we you know uh, what was it Friday night? I think Maria wore her Albert jersey and he ended up scoring. Uh, nice. So it's just it's it's great. It's we love that. Mm -hmm. uh, wrap it up. We just want to wrap up real quick. Um, uh, what else are you working on? I know you were working on the bear grid piece. Uh, last time we talked to you, you got that published, uh, anything else yeah. that you're working on, uh, before the end of the season or anything coming up? I'm hoping to get my top prospect list out. I'm still finalizing if it's going to be 25 or 15 or what it might be. Um, but definitely working on that. Wait um, to see who gets traded. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Brandon, <laughs> Friday is Friday is gonna be so bad for me. I'm gonna be in tears all day and anxious. I, like I already know it. I'm gonna need a lot of support. I'm gonna need a hug. <laughs> Somebody's gonna need to check on me. Yep. I already told no. Maria. I'm like, it's gonna be rough. It's gonna be anxiety all day. Yep. Sorry. Has Sorry to interrupt. Continue. <laughs> no, you're good. Just as long as it's not Bergy or Albert Johansson, we're good. Because I don't think they'll do Edginson or anything like that. As long as it's not those two, we're good. Um, but prospects, I might do another piece on Albert Johansson again at some point. Because um, I think he doesn't get enough appreciation. So I try to push him whenever he can. Like, I, I love Edginson. I really do. Um, I also really like Johansson. I feel like he kind of gets left behind unless you're a coach or a fan that really watches the game. So, and, or a teammate. Um, so all his teammates seem to really, really like what he does. So those are probably my next two um, prospects in Johansson, hopefully, as long as he doesn't get traded. 
That'd be great. <laughs> we'll definitely sync back up with the prospects because we are going to be looking more into that uh, when we head into the off season. We're not going to do draft profiles and all that crazy mm-hmm. stuff. The week, the week's podcast will take care of that for us. We're going right. to pretty much cover everybody that's in our pipeline already that will be that's making right. a difference here with Grand Rapids. So. Uh, we'll definitely have you on for another episode and maybe connect you with uh connect with Devin as well. Uh, because he's yeah. working on the same thing. <laughs> and uh Scott Wheeler just dropped his for us as well. So uh yeah. through the athletics. But where can we find you? How can we how can people connect with you and read what you've got out? Great question. So um I'm on the octopus store, it's just Caitlin Glaz on there. Um, and I'm looking at my Twitter handle. I should probably know it at this point, but I don't because I'm weird. Um so it is just KB Lady um, at all things DET. Um, so all things DET, like Detroit, um, is where I'm at on Twitter. Perfect, perfect. Uh, Brandon, do you have anything else that you want to wrap up or you want to put in? Or no, thank you, Katie. Again, appreciate you coming on. Uh, sorry, second time. We're not as uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you for bearing with us with those audio issues, but at the same time, thank you again. Sorry, we're not as chipper as usual with how exhausted we are after this long weekend, but. No, we appreciate you. You put out some great content and you, of course, love some of our favorite players as well. Uh, so, you know, we got to get you on more and more. So we'll talk to you more soon. But I think that's all I've got. Nick, anything else from you? I'm good. I appreciate you coming back out and uh, bearing with us today. <laughs> of course. Thank you for having me. Have a great night. You too. Thank you, you as well. You. Bye. All right. We're back. Thank you again to Katie for hopping on. Again, like we mentioned during the uh, interview with her there, we had had her on once and had some audio issues on our end. So we had to take more time out of her week here and get her back on and get the episode corrected. And I'm glad we did. I think we even got to talk about a little more than we talked about the first time, which was good. And she was fun to talk to. And uh, definitely someone, if you're a Wings fan or a Griffiths fan, go follow. Good content out there. And uh, obviously, just like both of us, or at least maybe me, I don't know about you, but a big Albert Johansson truther. So, uh, you know, we're on that same train together. And I'm just excited for it. Like, I'm excited for Anton. So for her to t- share that sp- uh, that piece with us, like that was kind of cool. So um, yeah, which didn't come up with the last time we talked to her. So uh, <laughs> a little bit something new for us as well. Yeah, so we'll have her on in the future, probably when that prospect uh, article comes out. We still got to get Devin back on here, too, since his is released, because I still want to give him some crap for some of his. So uh, (laughs) outside of that, sir, do you have anything else you want to add to this week's episode? So just real quick, just because we have been talking about prospects, uh, Trey Augustine on Friday night, MSU played Wisconsin, and he came up huge, uh, 44 saves, which is his career high now. And the Spartans took the Big Ten title. So he is a finalist for the Mike Richter Award. And he also just got the Big Ten title. Uh, so it's interesting to see where his uh, his path is leading um, I, <laughs> with the organization and with uh, how his college career is going. So uh, big news, big saves, big time tray. Like, I don't <laughs> like I'm getting excited about this and I'm. I don't know. I'm going to have to do some more. And our buddy Chris uh, is writing with the Spartans. And so we're going to have him on soon and uh, talk more about Trey after the season. So I uh, did want to put that in there because he did really well. Gold medal in the, for Team USA for the World Juniors. Comes back to MSU, finishes it out. Like just what a what a great season he's having. And uh, yeah, just a great season. He's not finished yet. He's got to win a national championship first. Yeah, they they start Big Ten Championship is uh, March 16th, if I had yeah. that right. So that sounds about uh, right. It's soon. Yeah, March 16th, single elimination. So we'll be following along with that just to see how they progress. But um, he's really carried the Spartan team on his back the whole season. Like they, I, I don't know how they're doing it without him. I, I, I don't think yeah. they can. Probably I really not. I want to be super excited about it too, but I also have to remember that we've seen some incredible Spartan goaltenders and college goalies in the past and they rush them and they don't pan out. So I want to say he has nothing left to prove like you, you know, you say that as well, but let's give it some time. I I want to, I don't want to rush him. I get nervous about Russian goalies. Yeah. Okay. Russian goal. No, he's American, bro. No, you know what I mean? <laughs> But yeah, no, it is good to see Trey do that. Good for them to win the national championship and or not national championship, big ten championship. Hopefully they win the national championship. Big ten title. Big ten title. Whatever. Same <laughs> college is so freaking confusing, man. 
Big Ten title championship is coming up March 16th. They start. Sorry, I was looking at the word champs on my hat here because you know Michigan won the national championship in football. So, oh, did they? Okay, they did. That, in case you hadn't heard, work, how's that working out for them with their coach? He's gonna <laughs> shut up. Um. Anyways, did, did outside they of that, him? <laughs> outside of that, anything else you want to add? No, they signed the guy that coached half the games this past season. <laughs> Oh, okay. I'm glad you caught me up to speed with that. <laughs> oh, I, did, I didn't know. Any, anyways, with that, I think that's a good place to wrap. What do you say? Yep. Cool. With that, thank you everyone for tuning in to the Monday episode this week. Shout out to Everything Hockey. Head over to everythinghockey.com. Use code WEST. Get $2 off your order. Uh, pick up some sweet hoodies and t-shirts. T-shirts especially because it's warming up in Michigan pretty quickly here. Loving that. But shout out to the Hockey Podcast Network for being fantastic partners. Shout out to DraftKings for also being a great sponsor. Shout out to our Patreon subscribers, which are Randy Zick, uh, Spencer Whitledge, and Michael Asante. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. And with that, everybody, have a fantastic week. Go Griffins, especially tomorrow night in Cleveland. Follow along on Twitter for all the highlights and updates for that. Go Griffins. Go Wings. Go Walleye. And we will talk to you all on Thursday. Love you. Bye. Thank you for tuning into the Hockey Town West podcast. Be sure to check us out on Twitter at Hockey Town W Pod and your host, Nick at GR Hockey Guy and Brandon at Brandon GR Hockey.